Well, welcome to the podcast. Uh, my name is Jeff, and it's great to have you with us today. Uh, today, my guest is a returning guest, Stephen Briggs, who is the Director of Operations for Hatikva Films and the executive producer of their award-winning documentary films, Cyrus Nations, UK, and America and the Israel Effect. He's also the producer of Moody Radio's national morning show, Don and Steve in the Morning, which is aired nationally from Hawaii to the Virgin Islands. Stephen is from the UK, and he met his wife, Melissa, while living in Jerusalem, and they now live in Tennessee. They are foster parents and ambassadors for Christian Friends of Emuna Israel, a charity that serves the neediest children in the Holy Land. Steve, that's quite an introduction, but uh, welcome back to the podcast. It's great to be back with you. Thank you for having me, Jeff. Well, you're welcome, and it's great to have you back, and we uh, have just enjoyed being able to get to know you better through our mutual connection with uh, Laura Delagarde, our executive producer. And so uh, we want to chat a little bit today. We've we've talked on the podcast before about America and the Israel Effect, this uh, amazing documentary that uh, you executive produced and uh, that was put out by Hatikva in we're going to talk a little bit about that, but but just overall, let's look at this idea of the blessing that comes with blessing Israel. Genesis twelve three, God says to Abram, I will bless those who bless you. And of course, usually when there's a, a positive, there's also a, another side to that. It says, and I will curse those who curse you and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so first big question is, in your opinion, is is this promise still in effect? Yeah, it, it wasn't done away with at the cross. It's uh, uh, and it was, if you like, let me put it in in this kind of terminology. It was God's decision to save the world, if I can use that terminology. I mean, He'd already made that decision, but it was the means by which He was going to bring that about. And Galatians three and verse eight re- re- references it. It actually says, "For Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel." Note that word, gospel beforehand to Abraham saying in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed which is a direct quote from mm. Genesis 12:3 so here we have Paul having an understanding that Genesis 12:3 was the gospel and the means by which it would be outworked which is very very exciting because it means both the blessings and the cursings are actually for the purpose of salvation they're not mutually exclusive. They're not kind of, this is something, you know, yes, there is a blessing attached to the blessing. But this verse is is taken as really the foundation of the declaration of the people of God being expressed throughout history. And of course, it talks in the New Testament about you are children of Abraham, if X, Y, and Z. And that's mm-hmm. believing, on, believing on the Lord Jesus. And then Abraham is referenced in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11. And it's by faith, Abraham, by faith, Moses, by faith, you know, and he says, if time doesn't permit me to go through all of these. And then at the very end of that passage in Hebrews 11, verse 39, it says, these all having not yet received the promises, because apart from us, that's you and me, Jeff, they cannot be made complete. So we're in the great, great, story that God is outworking where he's bringing both Jew and Gentile to be one in Messiah and to fulfill his eternal purpose which is defined in Ephesians 1 as one thing not purpose is it's defined as purpose and this is the the will of God it says the mystery of his will which is to sum up all things in Messiah things in heaven things on the earth and things under the earth which is a strange expression if you really think about it so coming back to this verse in Genesis 12:3 There are a couple of key components to it. One is the two words for blessing in Genesis 12 in Hebrew are the same, but the two words for curse are different. It's I will bless those who bless you, same word. But those who disesteem you, mock you, belittle you, and effect say nasty things about you, I will crush, oppose, or destroy. Two different words. And they're in the parameters of our understanding of the gospel. God doesn't desire to curse. He does it in order to bring us to himself. How did you come to know the Lord? It's because you recognized your sin and you recognized the consequences of your sin and where that consequence would lead to, which is death, right? And separation from God. And so the outworking of this is actually God's intent to not only save us as individuals, but actually to be involved in fulfilling Jesus's inheritance, which is defined in, Gen- in sorry in Psalm 2, where it says, why do the nations rage and the people's pot of vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers of, uh, take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. That word in Hebrew there is Mashiach, saying, come, 
Let us cast their cords away from us and tear their bonds asunder. And then it says, he that sits in the heavens will laugh. The Lord will have them in derision. And then it goes on in that verse in Psalm 2 to say some quite profound things, because actually it gives us a window into understanding what this is all about. So we have this king set on... um, Verse four, he he that sits in the heavens will laugh. So God has a sense of humor in understanding how the nations work. And then it says the Lord will have the nations in derision. Well, over what? Over the word of God being something they want to get rid of. What, What does that mean? Over the law of God, over the parameters that God has put in place on earth for man to relate to fellow man and for man to relate to God. They don't want it. And then it goes on, it says in verse six, yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. That hasn't changed. Zion, there is a specific hill. It's found in Jerusalem. It's always been known as the hill of God. And then it says in verse seven, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, well, who is he addressing? It says, the Lord said to me, you are my son. Okay, so we've got the father being asked of the son. This day have I begotten you. And the father says, ask of me. So here is the son, ask of me, and I will give the nations for your inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. So this whole conflict and the things globally going on with regard to the outworking of God's purpose actually has to do with Jesus' inheritance. It then says in verse 9, you shall break them with a rod of iron. Ah, so there's discipline involved. You shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. In other words, nations that don't come into line with his word and what the principles are, will have a judgment they'll have to face. And then the final couple of verses in in Psalm 2 says, Now therefore, so this is an option, be wise, O ye kings. And that gives us an indication that there are going to be some kings throughout history that are not so wise. We know that from history, evidence is is there. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, ye ra, that's reverence, and rejoice with trembling. And then this is a verse that a lot of Jewish people stumble over because they're like, oh, hang on a second. It says, kiss the son. What son is that talking about? The one that the father has recognized there. Lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath, that's God's wrath, will soon be kindled. Blessed are all those that take refuge in him. Now, within that Genesis 12, 3 statement, it's unpacked further in Genesis 15, Genesis 17, Genesis 22, Genesis 25, uh, 1 Chronicles 16, uh, Psalm 105. And it's expansionist in its understanding. It's like if I was to say, uh, hi, Jeff, my name's Stephen Briggs. That's very basic. It's the kind of the first thing. But then you ask further questions. You want to unpack more and know more about me. You know more about my wife, about my family. You mentioned about fostering. We don't stay in a position of just this simple statement, I will bless those who bless you. He says, well, explain it. Prove it to me. Did you mean it? And so we have in Genesis 15, the situation where God says, yeah, I'm going to prove it to you. And here's how I'm going to do it. Take some animals, cut them in half. And I am going to walk through as a sign of my promise to you. Now, that was how business was done in those days. It was a case you cut the animal in half, you walk through together, and you're essentially you're saying, if you break your side of the bargain, I have permission to cut you in half. I could unpack that verse uh, longer, but I don't want it to just, just be a monologue. But the, the key component of that is that God made a covenant with Abraham that he evidenced in the shedding of blood not only within the act within the Abrahamic covenant, but of course, every major covenant within scripture, the shedding of blood is involved, not least the new covenant. Amazing. Now, Stephen, I think having listened to you, uh, first of all, you've got a lot in that brain of yours. And uh, I'm amazed at how you remember all this stuff. But I want to also say that I think it's safe for us to assume then that uh, you feel like this promise is still in effect. It's relevant today. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. I do. Because it's it's never been done away with. So yes. there's nowhere in the New Testament that it says this has replaced, this new covenant has replaced the Abrahamic covenant. There is in the new covenant a place where the Mosaic covenant has been fulfilled in Christ. And this is where we need to be distinctive and understand 
Also, there was the covenant, the Davidic covenant, which talks about David sitting, Jesus sitting on the throne of David. That is yet to be fulfilled. It will happen. I mean, it has happened in the sense of he's gone and sat next to his father in heaven, but it's mm. going to be fulfilled literally on earth as well. Right. So we have to be contextualists. We have to take that which is in the scriptures within its context, if we take it out of its context, without its cotex, it becomes a pretext for a proof text. In other words, we can create anything we want out of it. And that's where heresies throughout history have happened. And mm-hmm. so this promise to Abraham, the father of us all, is really the guarantee, if you like, the evidences that God is going to fulfill the completeness of his word from Genesis to Revelation. Amazing. Now, I, you know, I could share some anecdotes about why I believe, uh, you know, this has been borne out in experience. But give us some historical examples that confirm in, in your mind that, that these verses are true, both, both on the blessing side and, and on the cursing side. Okay, well, the big contention that people have is why would God want some real estate in a dusty part of the world? And that's something that's when you own everything, you can choose to um, you can choose to where you want to live on that property, right? And so let's mm-hmm. just assume that it, it's, the Bible says in Psalms the the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, right? So He created this place; He has yeah. every right to choose where He wants His dwelling place to be. And in Psalm one hundred and five, verse eight to eleven, it says this, and this is crucial again because it's not my words; it's actually what is in the authority of the Word of God. He reiterates. Numerous times, just how significant this covenant with land is. I'll I'll read from verse 5. Actually, verse 4. I mean, the whole passage is wonderful, but for time, let's just do from verse 4. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face forevermore. So that's a call to believers. Remember his marvelous works that he has done. His wonders and the judgments of his mouth. Okay, so you've got works, wonders, and judgments, and they're all something that we're to remember and recall. O you seed of Abraham, his servant, there's the first one, you children of Jacob, his chosen ones, the second one, then it's an identification, he is the Lord our God, his judgments are in all the earth, and then this is where we kick into it, he has remembered his covenant forever, which covenant is he referencing, it's not the new covenant, the new covenant hasn't been made yet, It's not the Mosaic Covenant because it's Mosaic Covenant is conditional. So he's actually referring back because he starts with Abraham, this covenant that he made with Abraham. He has remembered his covenant forever. First one, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. Now, biblically, a generation is 40 years. It can be sometimes 70 years or even 100 years. But let's assume it's the lowest common denominator, 40 years. It says he remembers his covenant for a thousand generations. Okay, so the minimally we're looking at 40,000 years. The word which he commanded to a thousand generations. And then it says the covenant which he made with Abraham Mm -hmm. reinforced. It says his oath to Isaac and confirmed the same to Jacob for a statute to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying unto you will I give the land of Canaan, the allotment or the lot of your inheritance when you were but a few in number. Yes, very few. And so journeys in it. And then it goes on to talk about that journey and how they they process through it. So we have multiple times in that passage that a specific piece of real estate has been given to the seeds of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Now, you ask for evidence of where throughout history Genesis 12 has gone into effect. Well, an obvious one, Exodus 1, Pharaoh orders the Hebrew male babies to be drowned. They weren't. But there is a principle in scripture of reaping what one sows. And so what did happen? Pharaoh's men were chasing the Israelites through the through the Red Sea and Mm -hmm. they would drown themselves. They reaped what they had sought to sow on Israel. That's a singular example. You could look at the story of the book of Esther, Haman, Mordechai, the whole story. If Haman had set out to just kill Mordechai, God probably would have allowed it. But Haman overstepped or overreached, as the enemy so often does. And he was determined not only to kill Mordecai, but all of the Jews across the 127 provinces of Susa of Babylon. That's huge, because essentially what he's saying is, I plan on carrying out genocide to wipe the face of Israel and, and the seed lineage back to the, to the cross to stop it. And this is the crux of the issue. God has promised the land to a people. He promised that as a mechanism through which he would show himself to the nations to be an evidence in macro 
of the reality of God having a right relationship with a people group. Now, he wants to have a right relationship with all the nations of the earth because that's to do with his inheritance. But he uses Israel as an example to all of the other nations in the same way he uses you, Jeff, where you live in Canada, to be a witness of Jesus to your neighbors. Mm -hmm. You are in micro what Israel is called to be in macro. Just macro, the present position of them is they are largely Jacob by nature, not Israel. And so then we can look throughout history and look at some examples of nations that have risen and fallen in regards to the promise of God's word. Well, there was a great empire, the Greek empire, the Roman empire, the Persian empire, the Spanish empire, the Ottoman empire, the Dutch empire, the British empire. Where's the American empire going to end up? Well, we shall see. Every single one of those empires that has once been uh, glorious in their history where was their demise? Well, it actually, if you look at history, it appears to be when they choose to poke the apple of his eye, as it describes Israel in, I think it's Isaiah, it's either Isaiah or Jeremiah or Ezekiel, describes him as uh, Israel being the apple of his eye. It's as if God says, right, you're going to poke me in the eye, I'm going to splat you. You're going to, you know, if I went to poke you in the eye, Jeff, you'd, you'd swap my hand out of the way. You wouldn't want it to get anywhere near your eye because our eyes are very, very, need to be protected and need to be that which helps us to see. Right. And so we look through the annals of history. Yeah, Italy's still there, but her lifting days are over. She's financially, she's, you know, she's no, Greece is still there. Lifting days are over. Persia's still there. Okay, it's modern day Iran. You know, there's a, there's a whole story there, but she's not a major world power, although she's going to have a big influence in the days ahead, uh, temporarily, I might add. Uh, the British Empire is still there, though, again, her lifting days are over. There was a time when the sun never set on that empire. And that's what the film Cyrus Nations is all about and, and, and packs that. Britain, this tiny little offshore island of Europe, was given the responsibility to restore Israel back to the land as a fulfillment of what God's word says about bringing the Jewish people back. A right. remarkable responsibility. And unfortunately, they didn't follow through with what they promised. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Great examples. And uh, I think it's it's important for us as we think about what's going on in the world right now, and particularly uh, in the Middle East, to to have a basic understanding of all of this. Um, you know, you talked about about poking God in the eye and um, we at, at the risk of, of sounding generalist, you know, the the Islamic movement in the Middle East uh, let's say the let's say the militant uh, Islamic movement um, are are now causing a major problem in in Israel. Of course, the events of October seventh, we've all been horrified as more and more information comes to light and and more facts uh, are are brought to the surface. It's just just heart wrenching what happened to Israel on that day and. That day began, you know, this current conflict that we were in. So give us a little bit of context around, again, this topic of blessing and cursing and, and what you're talking about. Help us to understand what's going on with Hamas and where are we headed with this? Sure. Well, it's a huge subject and it's a subject mm -hmm. that we need to treat very, very carefully. It's not something that is easy to necessarily um, be dog dogmatic about. I was living in Israel at the time when the Gaza pullout took place in 2005. I remember the travesty of it. And a Jewish brother, a dear, dear friend of mine, described it as Israel was uh, amputating a live baby. Israel was a relatively new state. And what was going on with withdrawing the Jewish people who were living in Gaza out and the pain and the turmoil that went through the nation and I remember witnessing this thing and thinking, this is going to come back to bite. It's going to come back to be a real, real thorn in the flesh in Israel's um, society. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first thing that I remember seeing, and I've, I had newspaper cuttings of it because it was such a significant seismic event that you just knew that this was not going to end well. Um, the uh, Palestinians that entered back into Gaza or that, that took over every area that the Jewish people were in, went in and smashed the greenhouses. They were handed businesses on a platter that were very fruitful, no, no pun intended. They were given properties. I mean, Gaza was a lovely place I mean, in the sense of how Israel had developed it. it was, uh, it's got a stunning beach. I mean, you, if you've ever been to the beach in Tel Aviv, think of that all the way down to, to Gaza and you're getting closer and closer to, to Egypt. Therefore, it's going to be warmer there than it is even in, in Tel Aviv. And Tel Aviv mm. gets pretty hot and pretty humid. So um, 
from that perspective, it's worth us understanding now what's what's the key component and how can we rightly divide and discern what's going on in the in the broader scene? Well, we have to understand that first and foremost, this is principally a theological issue. The Bible says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and world rulers of this darkness, right? So we have to look at it through the lens of scripture. And we have to recognize that actually God promised that he would bring Israel back to the land as a fulfillment of his promise to Abraham Mm -hmm. and in order for them to be a blessing for the whole world. And the world at present doesn't necessarily see that as a blessing. Certainly the Islamic world sees it as a thorn in the flesh for them. Now, why do they do that? Because within Islamic theology, and this is this is the crux of it, the, uh, the theology drives the ideology that brings about the reality. So we have to take hold of the theology and understand the theology of other cultures in order to engage appropriately with those cultures and be aware of them. Now, within Islamic theology, their God, Allah, always brings them victory. That's the first thing. OK, mm. secondarily, they are permitted to lie if it advances Islam. That's also very, very important. Islamic theology allows you to lie if it advances Islam. Christianity, the opposite. Judaism, the opposite. You know, do not lie. It's one of the one of the things right. that we're told not to do. Islam doesn't have that. That is not one of their laws. The other thing that delineates the Quran, the Islamic holy book from the Bible, is nowhere in the Quran does the Quran say God is love. Okay, whereas in the Bible, Deuteronomy evidences it throughout. And we see the story of love. Greater love has no man than this than he lays down his life for his friends. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes on him should not perish and have eternal life. You know, that is the the most well-known verse in the entire globe from the Bible. Absolutely. And so... Let's look at this. Let's look at this theology and let's unpack it, because once we understand it and once we understand what it's standing for, it helps us to rightly engage with it. So within our most recent completed film, America and the Israel Effect, that you're going to provide the link for, which is available to watch for free, we touch on one of the articles of the Hamas Charter. Now, the Hamas Charter came about in 1988. It has been revised somewhat. But I'd encourage your listeners to go and read the original Hamas charter. Within that, multiple times, there is the um, declaration that they simply want to kill Jews for being Jews. Mm -hmm. And so there is uh, the very fact that Israel is back in land, which at one time was governed by the Ottoman Empire, the Islamic, Islamic Empire. Islamic theology teaches that once you own a piece of land... That is Islam's perpetually. So Israel being placed back into the land is an affront to Islamic theology, which is why there's such a conflict over it. Hmm. The next thing that we have to understand looking at it is, okay, well, if that's the case, then show me where this is evidenced in Scripture with regards to the land. And I've already showed you with that Psalm 105 and the promise that God has made. Mm -hmm. But it it says it multiple times, and it talks about God bringing the Jewish people back. Jeremiah 31, 3 to 10 talks about it. I'll, I'll read that to you because it's important for us to see that it's not man's doing that Israel is back in the land. It's God's doing. It says in Jeremiah 31, verse 3, The Lord appeared of old unto me, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. There's that love again. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn you. Again, will I build you. So notice they were built and they're no longer built. But it says, again, will I build you and you shall be built, O virgin of Israel. Again, shall you be adorned with tabrets and shall go forth in the dances of them that make merry. Again, you shall plant vineyards on the mountains of Samaria. The planter shall plant and shall enjoy the fruit thereof. For there shall be a day that the watchman upon the hills of Ephraim shall cry, Arise, let us go up to Zion to the Lord our God. And then verse 7 says, For thus says the Lord, Sing with gladness for Jacob, shout for the chief of the nations, publish and praise and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnants of Israel. So here they are back in the land, not yet saved, and there's a cry for it. And then this gives us a key component. It helps us give us a timeline as well. Behold, I will bring them from the north country. Well, we had a million and a half Jews come back from Russia. It was what was known as Alia. But it doesn't just stop there. It says, and gather them from the uttermost parts of the earth 
And with them, the blind, the lame, the woman with child and her that travails with child together, a great company shall they return here. They shall come with weeping and with supplications will I lead them. I will cause them to walk by rivers of waters in a straight way wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel and Ephraim as my firstborn. And then verse 10 says, hear the word of the Lord, O you nations, and declare it in the isles of Pharaoh and say that he that scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. So here we have a proclamation. It's repeated also in um, Deuteronomy 30. It talks about the Jewish people being exiled because of their for want of a better word, their misbehavior. They're not doing what God said. Mm -hmm. But he also promises that he's going to restore them. He does that as well in Ezekiel 36. He talks about bringing them back from the nations. People say, oh, well, that was when they came back from Babylon. But that scripture we just read says from the north country and all of the other uttermost parts of the earth. So it can't be from Babylon because Babylon was to the east. So it's giving us a different time frame altogether. Well, you and I live in the generation where this has actually literally been fulfilled right in front of our eyes and continues to be fulfilled as Alia continues to happen, which is an affront to, to Islam because that land for a short season, relatively speaking, the Ottoman Empire, okay, 400 years, you know, in the grand scheme of things, when the land was promised, has been governed for a period by those that adhere to Islam. Now, that's a bit of a whirlwind. I recognize that. Stop, <laughs> take a breath. Let's think it through. And then then let's let's think about this. If God intended to restore the Jewish people back to the land to be a blessing to the whole world, that includes the Arabs as well. And the medicines, the mobile phones, the water technology across the Islamic world, if they really wanted to do a BDS, they'd have to throw the mobile phone in their pocket. They'd have to throw all of the medicines that they take. They'd have to throw the technology, the laptops. The, the It's just unreal. It's, it's basically in this day and age, it's impossible not to use some form of Israeli technology in, in day-to-day life. And yet they encourage people to, to not do that. Mm -hmm. Now, if we take hold of that theology and unpack it a little bit further, the theology within Islam is shame and honor. It's not truth and lies. The foundation of the scriptures is Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth and the life. Within Islam, it's all to do with honor and shame. And God understands this. And he understands it so well that he actually wrote about it in the scriptures. And people say, well, hang on a sec. Where, where is that addressed? Well, Psalm 83 is a psalm that's been quoted by a lot of people in this window of time. But it starts with a prayer. And this is this should be your prayer and my prayer. It says, oh, God, keep not silent. God, hold not your peace. And God, don't be still. And that if, if when was the last time you, you shouted at God and prayed in that way? I mean, it's quite a strong prayer, if you think about it. It's like this mm -hmm. is a, it's called a psalm of Asaph. But within that passage, there are so many things that are really, really helpful to us. God, keep not silent, hold not your peace and be not still, O God, which implies there's a season in, in time where actually it appears that God is being silent. God is not acting. You know, that's, that's a strange, you know, we have to read scripture in its context. Say, so, well, what is it saying to us and how does it unfold? Right. And then it says, verse two, for lo, your enemies make a tumult and they that hate you have lifted up their heads. So it's the hatred of God that drives what comes next of the real God, I might add. They take crafty counsel against your people. Okay, which people is it re referencing? Of course, it's the Jewish people because of the context of it. But by wider implication, it's also the church and Christians. And consult together against your hidden ones. And then this is the proclamation that's made. And Ahmadinejad, the former leader of Iran, while I was living in Israel, held a congress saying a world without Zionism. And he actually quoted the Bible without realizing it. He quoted in, in Farsi, come let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. Now, this has historically happened before. It's where the name Palestina, Palestine comes from, mm -hmm. was in the Roman time when they renamed Jerusalem Iolia Capitolina and they renamed the region Palestine. Well, Iolia Capitolina didn't stick, but Palestine did. And so we have this in this modern iteration of, of the word that is used for the Palestinians. But interestingly, if we want to be really modern in our history, Jordan technically is Palestine because that's what it was named 
pre the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan being created by the British. And we've got a film that goes into all of that in great detail called The Forsaken Promise, or you can watch the short version on YouTube. Just search for Hatikva films and the betrayal of the Jews, and it goes into that period of history in great detail. Then there's verse four, let them be no more in remembrance, let the name of Israel be no more in remembrance. And then it says in verse five, for they have consulted together. So who's they? We need to establish who they are. Consulted mm -hmm. together with one consent against you, that's against God, that they make a covenant. And then it lists a whole host of regions that are now populated by Islamic nations. Edom, Ishmaelites, Moab, Hagarines, Gebel, Ammon, Amalek, all of those enemies of Israel of old, and um, gives us a context to it. And then tells us, takes us back to Judges 4 and Judges 7, which I'd encourage you to look at. But then I, where I really want to get to is looking at the last part of this passage, where in verse uh, 14, or let's do verse 13, we have this prayer. Pursue them, that is those nations, with your tempest terrify them with your storm now that seems strange why would i as a believer pray that god would pursue someone with a storm or terrify them with a, with a tempest it seems like a very weird way to pray doesn't it hmm. but then notice the next verse verse 16 fill their faces with confusion or in hebrew that word is dishonor now, if we understand the Islamic honor and shame culture, fill their faces with dishonor. Well, how are they dishonored when their God loses in battle that they may seek your name, O Lord? Ah, so salvation is tied up with people being dishonored or shamed because it causes them to question their theology. Let And then it says that they may seek your name, O Lord. And then there's a closing of it. It says in verse 17, let them be put to shame and dismayed forever. Let them be confounded, confused and perish, that they may know that you alone, whose name is the Lord, are the most high over all the earth. So what we have in this passage gives us a wonderful window into understanding how God is going to save multitudes and multitudes from the Islamic world. And it comes through them being humiliated dishonored so if i could say it like this the gospel that jesus came to proclaim was he was dishonored and then honored that you might be honored with him he he, he took the shame of the cross isaiah 9 upon himself by his stripes we are healed he raised to life he was restored he sits now at the right hand of the father ever living to make intercession for us and he longs for jew and gentile jew and arab to be found in him complete and that's the reconciliation that we see between jacob and esau isaac and ishmael and it's going to happen again in the future because Isaiah 19 promises that there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria, one Islamic land to another Islamic land with Israel in the middle. And that ver last verse in Isaiah 19, which talks about the whole situation within Egypt, describes Egypt as his people, Assyria the work of his hands, and Israel his inheritance. Now, think about that word for a moment, Egypt, my people. God said, I want nothing to do with you. Mm. He said, I, let my people go. Right. He, he, so, he went so far as to kill every firstborn son across the nation of Egypt in, or the empire of Egypt in order to release the Jewish people. Now, when we think of that firstborn son, that doesn't just mean children. You know, my son said to me, and it was quite a profound statement. He said, that means Pharaoh mustn't have been the firstborn son because he would have been killed. He must have been a second born son, right? Yeah. So you've got grandparents who are first born, sons first born, you know, grandsons first born. And that, I was like, wow, he was only young. I was like, that is a really, really profound thought process. It would have devastated the economy. And therein lies the principle that we talked about right at the very beginning of a nation that was blessed when she looked after the Jewish people within the land. Uh, of Egypt. And then when she started persecuting them, that was the end of the Egyptian empire, not least with the firstborn, uh, with the sons of um, her firstborn sons being killed. Um, that's very, very long winded. Happy to unpack any of those components for you, Jeff. Well, I think that uh, what I really want to get to before we finish here is, you know, talking about this current conflict. Okay. Uh, we have we have a, an interesting sort of quagmire in the world right now because there are so many people who are, um, what's the word I'm going to look for here, sort of 
justice, uh, humanitarian focus who are crying out about this uh, current situation. And uh, from a biblical perspective, help us understand the difference between um, a war with Palestine or, or Palestinians, I should say, and a war with Hamas, because uh, because these are two very different things. And I think I want people to know, I think everybody wants people to know that we don't, because we say we stand with Israel does not mean that we stand against uh, Arabs or Palestinians. Um, we stand with Israel and her right to defend herself against this evil, which has been perpetrated against her. And I think there's people are having a hard time with this right now. So, so help us biblically with that. Yeah, absolutely. And let me let me start this in the same way. Hopefully this will be helpful to you. Do you think you as a listener, as a watcher of this podcast, can possibly love the people that identify themselves as Palestinians more than God does? No, right? We do. We can. We can. We can love to the extent with which we have been loved. That is what Scripture says. And thankfully, He has loved us so much in that He sent His only Son to take our place in the in the courtroom on our behalf. And right. um, to the the Bible actually says, "To the measure that you have been forgiven, it will be forgiven you." Right? That's why the Lord's Prayer says, "Forgive, as uh, if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven." And so these precious civilians caught up in what is going on uh, now in uh, in Gaza is tragic. And every single one of those lives matters. And God sees the lives of all of those Amen. Palestinian civ for civilians that are being kept in Gaza by the uh, Hamas regime. This is important to note. Israel is not targeting civilians at all. They have a great value for life. Their, their mantra is to save a life is to save the world. Whenever there is a natural disaster anywhere in the world, usually they are the first or at, at the last second or third res, quickest responders into a, a disaster situation to help countries. And they've done that all over the world. They do not want uh, to kill indiscriminately, and they're not. They have dropped thousands upon thousands of leaflets, as they always do whenever they target Gaza. They have instructed and given weeks for civilians to get out of the area that they want to ensure they get control of. Hamas is a different story. Hamas's charter, and again, if you watch America and the Israel Effect, we'll unpack this, is an entity that their constitution, I think is the easiest way to describe it, defines multiple times that their sole, their primary purpose, I wouldn't say it's their sole purpose, but their primary purpose is to destroy the Jews simply for being Jews, to carry out ethnic cleansing. Mm -hmm. Israel, that's not their heart. They are wanting to deal with uh, something that is um, indiscriminately targeted civilians, beheading babies, kidnapping 249 uh, elderly women and children and taking them into a labyrinth of tunnels underneath. Their headquarters are underneath a hospital which violates all international law, which means that actually Israel has been hamstrung in actually dealing with the the uh, the, the headquarters of this organization. Mm -hmm. But to, to help us grapple with that as well, we have to understand that the word Hamas actually in Hebrew means violence, it means cruelty. And so we're not dealing with an entity that values life in the same way that you do. Jihad in the Hamas definition of it within their constitution is the greatest calling one can have. To die carrying out jihad, martyrdom, is a high calling. And coming out of this situation, the, there was a 43-minute video that was shown to journalists that no media has been brave enough to put out, which was explaining and giving illustrations of, for example, one of the Palestinian, the Hamas terrorists that went into, um, into uh, Israel, put his mum on camera, look at all the Jews I've killed, mum, my reward's going to be great. You know, and, and you just think that is so horrendous and heinous that that would be your motivation and that you would call your mum to celebrate that is is beyond my comprehension. I wouldn't I couldn't dream of mm. celebrating something like that. But yet the value within Hamas's world system and what they believe in their um, 
constitution is that this has a high calling. There's actually a greater reward for killing on, on Muslims' holiest day than other days of the week. They believe that there is a greater reward depending on how many Jews they actually kill. Okay, so we have an entity that doesn't care whether it's a Jewish soldier or a Jewish child or a Jewish mother. They just want to have been one that gets things. And then you want to kind of unpack a little bit further. So within their reward system in the current Hamas structure and the PLO structure, they actually pay terrorists that are in prison in uh, Israeli prisons who have carried out terrorist attacks greater stipends based on how many Jews they killed. Right. And uh, it's hard. How how can you possibly get your head around that practically when you realize that this is an entity that doesn't think the way the West thinks and doesn't see the same value system as as the West values? Now, once we begin to recognize that there is a thought process that is completely different to how we perceive and how we interact, it helps us to engage more effectively. We have a a. Uh, uh, a DVD, a film that you can watch on Vimeo called Sister Religions, which unpacks looking at Islam, looking, and we don't have time to go into that, Dimitude, Takiyah, and Jizya, three terms within Islam that we really need to understand and grapple with as believers. We can put a link in the chat underneath the podcast that will take you to that. Mm -hmm. Because to give you another illustration, when we send international aid to an Islamic uh, nation, it is not received as international aid. It is received as tribute money. We're better than you. Thank you for paying us. Wow. And that's, again, hard for our Western minds to comprehend because we've been so schooled in our generosity because the Bible teaches us to be generous that actually giving to those in need is something that is honored and revered and respected. But just because you've given in that way doesn't necessarily mean it's received in that way. It's received more as trib tribute money. And so what you are doing by giving international aid in these situations is actually reinforcing the Islamic supremacy complex that's within Islam. Does that make sense? Let me let me read a couple of things because I actually have some of the charter in front of me. Um, 36 separate articles in Hamas's charter, all of which promote the basic Hamas goal of destroying the state of Israel through jihad. This is this. And, and they wrote it down in black and white like that. This is what boggles my mind. But, you know, um, one of the, the goals, they say, is a dis, uh, who's a, this um, resistance movement is distinguished Palestinian movement whose allegiance is to Allah and whose way of life is Islam. It strives to raise the banner of Allah over every inch of Palestine. That's one of the, the things. Israel will exist and continue to exist until Islam will obliterate it just as it obliterated others before it. Um, peace, peace agreements. They actually wrote this down about peace agreements. Uh, these initiatives and so-called peaceful solutions and international conferences are in contradiction to the principles of the Islamic resistance movement. Those conferences are no more than a means to appoint the infidels as arbitrators in the lands of Islam. There is no solution for the Palestinian problem except by jihad. Initiatives, proposals, and international conferences are but a waste of time and exercise in futility. So there's something for everybody who's out there saying, well, we need to talk more about a, a two-state solution. We need to, you know, have a peace agreement. We need to, listen, this, as long as these kind of people are in charge, uh, that's not, it's not on the table. It's not even, not even part of the conversation. And, uh, and then, of course, you know, you mentioned this, and, and these, this is the exact wording, the day of judgment will not come about until uh, Muslims fight Jews and kill them. Then the Jews will hide behind rocks and trees and the rocks will cry out, oh, Muslim, there is a Jew hiding behind me. Come and kill him. All articles of Hamas's charter. So all of that to say this for, for believers, for Christians who are out there and they're struggling, you know, they're saying, how, how can I support Israel in what's, in what's happening? Uh, if I stand, if I say I stand with Israel, does that mean I condone, you know, everything that that the IDF does, for example, um, help people sort of grapple with that just a little bit before we're done here, Stephen. And 
you know, I think I think for me, this is these are some of the conversations that we're having too. We're, we're saying to people, look, we we are praying for innocent civilians on the Palestinian side. We also believe that this is heinous evil that has been that has been done to the nation of Israel, and that Israel has a right to respond. And we we feel like you know, within that right, Israel will will be careful about. Uh, about collateral damage, they are not targeting civilians, um, all of those kinds of things. But but help a believer come to grips with that just a little bit before we're done. You're right. It's it's not easy. It's not easy to process. And the the you know we'd be we'd be lying if we said it was. Yeah, <laughs> There's exactly. so much complexity to this, and we we have to look at it again from through the lens of scripture and recognize that there is two kingdoms there's a kingdom of light and a kingdom of darkness there's a uh, a king on the side of the kingdom of light that uh has characteristics that are defined with love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness and self-control and on the on the flip side there is an enemy that wants to steal kill and destroy and he is hell-bent on doing that he wants to destroy anything that points us to the fact that there is a God in heaven. He's going to settle for nothing less than taking as many people to hell with him as he possibly can. Mm -hmm. And so to have a entity that doesn't care whether it lives or dies because its greatest honor is to die a martyr and to take as many other people dead with them through the form of killing indiscriminately is a distinctive. If Hamas was on your back doorstep and they came in and they stole your child and kidnapped them what would you expect canada to do what would you expect america to do what would you expect england to do you know the western nations whatever nation it is i i've walked through this you know i've got kids of my own and thinking wow how would i respond how would i want the nations to respond would i want them to turn a blind eye to that reality would i want them to just pretend that it doesn't exist? Of course not. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, I'd want them to be shouting from the rooftops, my child, nine months old, is somewhere in a tunnel in Gaza or in a tunnel in Canada, to use that illustration. Yeah. Go and rescue them, help us find where they are. And so we have to understand that we're not dealing with a reasonable partner for peace in Hamas. Mm -hmm. And their constitution illustrates that. The second thing that we have to recognize is this is not people that uh, got into power by a coup. They won by a landslide in their election. Now, admittedly, they only had one election. They then banned elections in Gaza beyond that point. Mm -hmm. But they won by a landslide. So the majority of those that live in Gaza actually chose to support Hamas in taking leadership and responsibility of that nation. And so they have been oppressing their civilians and using aid that has been delivered to them. I even read a report just the other day that Hamas was stealing fuel from the hospital, which is treating patients who are wounded for their own means to continue terrorist activity. Hmm. Now that to me, uh, that should cause me to, to scream out loud. That is, it's downright wicked. And, and, and so we have to recognize evil where evil is being expressed and where it's being expressed to the point that actually the heart cry of a believer is to set the oppressed free and the oppressed in this situation are those Arabs that are living in Gaza that are under the tyrannical rule of Hamas who want to be let out of Gaza, but Hamas has prevented them from leaving. Yeah. And Hamas has put them in place as human shields. And any culture that says, I'm going to put my baby, my child, my six-year-old, my seven-year-old, I'm going to use them as collateral. So when, it, when a... Um, a uh, terrorist site is taken out, I can say they killed a civilian. That just needs to be routed from the face of the earth. And uh, yes, God is a God of mercy. He can meet people right up to the point of their um, their death. But 
we are dealing with something that really doesn't want, <laughs> if I can put it this way, it doesn't want to be saved. It wants to destroy those. And then we have to look at, again at the broader picture. If Israel is wiped out as a nation, bear, based on and recognizing the promises of God and what he said, it means that your safety and security, your salvation is not secure at all. Because he says multiple times in his mm. word that if his covenant with night and day ceases, so does his covenant with the Jewish people. So we have to take hold and recognize that actually this battle that we're seeing, this outward expression of a spiritual battle between light and darkness, actually is to do with the security of your salvation as well. Because he promised that he as the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, as the God of Israel, would protect them and keep them as a shepherd keeps his sheep. Mm -hmm. So it's actually to do with the character of God that we are seeing this. Now, do I grieve for the civilians that are caught up in this? Of course, we all grieve yeah. for any civilian caught up in a situation of war. But as believers, we should not be surprised that this has happened. In the same way, we shouldn't be surprised that uh, Ukraine and Russia has happened. In the same way, we shouldn't be surprised that there are other rumors of wars and wars in the Yemen and the Houthis getting involved in this. Why? Because the Bible tells us in Matthew 24, 25, Luke 21, Mark 13, that in the last days, wars and rumors of wars will be happening. And actually everything in that passage in Matthew 24, 25 is going to be evidence that we're stepping ever closer to the day when Messiah is returning. And that should be something that excites you and thrills your heart because it, we see where evil leads us in what's going on today. We see that actually we need a savior and a redeemer. We need a king of kings and a lord of lords to rule over this earth. And man is looking for a counterfeit peace, but only Jesus provides true and lasting peace. Well, Stephen, thank you. Those are profound and uh, deep words. And I hope that people listening take them to heart and can find some understanding there. We, uh, you know, I just, I challenge people especially believers, well-meaning believers who in your zeal for sort of mercy and justice for innocent Palestinians are are vocal and and at protests talking about freeing Palestine and, and chanting things like from the river to the sea. Listen, do your homework, understand what's really at, at play here. Yes, be zealous for mercy and for innocent civilians, but but don't be uh don't let that be used as being on the side of, of Hamas and what is happening in, in this conflict, because, you know, it's just another way that the enemy will use people to uh, to get his his uh, objectives accomplished. And I think that we have to be very, very careful about that. Um, listen, lots of stuff we could talk about, Stephen. I think we, we've almost uh, used up an hour here. We'll have to have you back on and, and talk some more about this. But let people know how they can uh, find out about you and about the film. We will put those uh, those addresses up on screen, but just verbally give everybody the opportunity to find your stuff. Yeah, so we've, we've just partnered in the past week or so with Revelation Media and um, our new newest film, which is called American the Israel Effect, which does touch on Hamas. It explains some of the uh, American history of Israel's uh, restoration. You can get that at get.revelationmedia.org and then forward slash watch the Israel effect, all one word. Watch the Israel effect, and that's at get.revelationmedia.org. And all you need to do is put your email address in there and you can watch the film for free. Hatikvafilms.com is the website where the other films are available. That's H A T I K V A H films.com and Hatikva means the hope and that's really what our films are all about there is a glorious redemptive story that you and I are a part of that results in an amazing future ahead of us and it's found in the word of God from Genesis to Revelation and we need to open that book so hatikvafilms.com and I mentioned about the kidnapped in Israel as well kidnapped from Israel I should say uh, there's a website where you can go called kidnappedfromisrael.com where you can download pictures of everybody that's been kidnapped. And why not take just one of those individuals and pray 
that the Lord would return them back to their family. That would be what I would want if uh, one of my children had been kidnapped. Amen. I want people all around the world to be praying that the Lord would restore them back to me. And supernaturally, if need be, we've seen one or two hostages returned. And uh, let's pray and, and long Amen. as 1 Samuel 30, where all the hostages were returned, would come back to their to their families. Amen. Stephen, thank you so much again for being with us on the podcast today. And uh, if you are out there, you're watching, listening, you want to do something in response to what's happening in the war in Israel, you want to help uh, the Jewish people, you can go to our website, firstcenturyfoundations.com and uh, click on donate what right now all the designated funds for emergency response for the war in Israel, 100% of those funds are going directly to six or seven key partners that we're working with there in the land who are doing um, great work, helping displaced families, feeding them, um, working with trauma victims, counseling. There's just all kinds of ways that our partners are uh, helping to assist, and we want to encourage you to do that. So thanks for tuning in. God bless you. Have an amazing day. Thanks for watching. You can listen to this entire podcast on your favorite audio podcast platform. Find the link below. And while you're at it, don't forget to click subscribe and follow us on Facebook so you can stay connected to First Century Foundations.